Hello, this is Bob Cornell, and I hope you're having a wonderful day. This is Understanding the Holy Spirit, and in this video, I'm going to be dealing with one of the most important things I think we can deal with as it concerns the Holy Spirit, and that is the anointing of the Holy Spirit. You know, it's a subject that sometimes brings confusion to the believer, but I hope in this video to bring clarity to this very, very important subject, again, on the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Well, if you haven't done so already, subscribe to this Cornell Ministries YouTube channel, press the thumbs up button, that's like, that really does help to get the word out and grow this channel. In this video, I'm going to be starting out with four things that the anointing is not, and then we're going to take a look at what the anointing is, and then we're going to take a look at four types of the anointing seen in the Bible. Now, I have a handout that you can download. It's in the first comment of this video, and I'm going to put some notes in the screen, but most of it is in this handout, and uh, so you can, again, you can download uh, that handout. Let's see, Let's put the notes on the screen here as I have been doing in this whole video series about understanding the Holy Spirit. First of all, four things that the anointing is not. Let me, let me just say this. Before we get into number one, let me mention this as it concerns the anointing. You know, sometimes there is confusion about the anointing of the Holy Spirit because uh, we think of it in one way only. For example, uh, if there is a, a church service or a prayer meeting or just a personal time of prayer or worship with the Lord, uh, we sense the presence and the moving of the Holy Spirit, and we refer to that sometimes as the anointing, uh, or God touches someone, or the, again, there's a church service, and or there's a song or a message, and we sense again the, the presence and the moving of the Spirit. And we say, well, that is the anointing. Well, yes, that is true. I'm getting ahead of myself. Yes, that is true. But sometimes we limit the anointing to that alone. But the anointing, as we will see in God's Word, is greater than just simply the presence and the moving of the Holy Spirit in a church service or in a prayer meeting, etc. Uh, I don't want to limit that, but again, there's more to it than just that. So let's take a look at four things the anointing is not. Now, as we get into these four things, let me mention this, and you can see it on the screen here. The anointing will, will affect each of these things, but it is not any of these things without the Spirit. So number one, the anointing is not emotion. Now, when I say not emotion, I'm meaning that it's not solely emotion. You see, emotion is the moving of our feelings. Now, God gave us emotion, so emotions are not bad, okay? I want to want you to understand that sometimes the statement can be made, you know, we don't live by feelings or emotion, we live by faith, and that is true. But sometimes with that statement, uh, we can take a negative view of emotion and feelings, and, and that should not be the case, okay? God gave us emotions, and what we see in God's Word is that our emotions are to be used uh, in response to what God does in our life. And emotions are to be used in praise and worship, okay? So uh, there's nothing wrong with emotion, but emotion all by itself is not the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Now, emotion is the moving of our feelings, it's how we emotionally react to talent, to personality, and to the moving of the Holy Spirit. Now, again, sometimes people get confused here because the anointing can and will uh, move our emotions. And again, that's important. The anointing of the Holy Spirit can and will move our emotions, whether that's in a message or that's in a, a worse time of worship, or it could be you just all by yourself and just the presence of God comes upon you and there's an emotional reaction. Okay, So again, the anointing does move our emotions, but all by itself, emotions do not equal the anointing. So what does that mean? It means that uh, there can be emotions uh, in a service, in a prayer meeting, or just by yourself. We can have an emotional response, but that by itself does not mean 
the anointing is present. All right, number two, the anointing is not talent. Now, this is, goes, all these really go hand in hand, one with another. Talent, that's our natural giftings uh, committed to our trust to be used and improved. Now, God gives us talent, but natural talent and abilities can be used while in sin. Sometimes, again, people get confused here because the talent can be so remarkable that it's believed that the anointing must be present, but that's not always the case. So again, emotion and talent, they really go hand in hand one with another, but sometimes a person can be so talented that uh, people, we, the way that we react to that talent, it, again, is with an emotional reaction and, and with that, with the talent and emotion, we think the, uh, the anointing must be here because there was so much talent on display uh, and emotion, and so it must be anointed, we think. But that is not always the case. Now, God will use talent, definitely. Again, I don't want to shy away from that. But that all by itself does not equal the anointing. Let me give you an example of this. Several years ago, I was flipping through the channels on television, and I had the television on mute. And as I'm flipping through the channels, I came across this scene where it was a large group of people. People had their hands raised, most of them. Some people were, were waving their hands. And at first sight, it again, with the mute on, I thought for sure this is some type of worship service. And me, I if it's a worship service, okay, I want to hear it. And the way that it looked, it looked as if it was a great worship service. And I wanted to participate in that. So I turned the sound on. And as I'm watching it, I'm hearing Elton John. I'm hearing one of his classic songs. And I don't listen to that music, okay, secular music, but I've heard enough of it to recognize, okay, that was Elton John. And then the scene changes, and of course, there he is sitting at the piano playing one of his classic songs. And But here's the thing. The way that the people were reacting, it was they were reacting to talent. They were reacting in such a way that it was almost identical to a worship service. But I'll tell you what, the presence of God was not there. Some might even say in that situation that it was an unholy anointing. But I want to say this, that they were responding to talent, of which that man is very, very talented in the natural. So, you know what, the same thing can happen in a church, but we're just singing worship songs unto the Lord, or it can be, again, it can be any style, it can be any genre, and I, when I made genre, I'm talking, you know, contemporary style, or southern gospel, or even the hymnal, old, very old hymnal style, okay, uh, the singer can can sing a high note, or the musician can play a rip, you know, on a on a saxophone, or a guitar, or, th or the piano, and just go off, and again, very, very talented, and I'll use a singer, the singer can sing a, a, a high note, or in a Southern Gospel group that's very well known, the Southern Gospel groups, they'll, at the very end of it, they'll fluctuate their voices, and people will just go, yeah, they'll just go, sometimes they'll go crazy. Does that mean it's the anointing of the Spirit? I'll say no, and then, now, let, me, let me just say this. I'm not speaking against an, Southern Gospel or contemporary music or any genre. That's not the point. What I'm saying is that sometimes as, as believers, we can think that talent equals the anointing. It must be the anointing. Look at that. They just did this awesome high note, or they just fluctuated their voices in such a way that it's, oh, it's so cool, and people are responding. They're clapping their hands, and they're getting excited, so it must be the anointing. Get this. That does not mean that it's the anointing of the Holy Spirit. It could simply be an emotional response to talent and to personality. And so uh, I hope you get the point there. All right, number three is this. 
is personality. And again, all these go together. Personality, it's the quality of who we are expressed socially with others. It includes individual character traits. Now, a dynamic personality will move people, but it's no substitute for the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And I think you get the the gist here of where we're heading with this. It could be a minister, it could be a singer, and they can have a very charismatic, dynamic personality. And they're very well-versed, in a sense, in performing. And it gets people's reaction, okay? And sometimes that reaction, because there is a reaction to a dynamic or charismatic personality, that it is believable the anointing was there, okay? And that can be said, well, the anointing must have been present because of the way that people were were responding to a dynamic and charismatic personality. My point is this, is that just that personality alone does not mean that the anointing of the Holy Spirit was working in that service or in that event. So that's important to understand. All right, number four, the last one is experience. So I wonder, what do you mean by experience? Well, experience, it's the knowledge gained through past experiences. This is the most dangerous of them all because we know how to function in the anointing. Again, we, we, have, we have sensed the presence of God so often and so that we know how, again, to function when the anointing is present. Now, there is a tendency in that, okay, to follow a particular protocol in a service or in a prayer meeting, or it could, again, it could be collectively or privately, and, and we know how to follow a particular protocol, the know-how, and we, so we know how it's done, what's done. It could be singing, it could be praying for people, it could be ministering, uh, it could be just the order of service, and, and so we know how it's done, and that's experience. Now, I want to s- clarify this w- with a statement that experience is wonderful. God uses experience for you and I as a child of God. And we need it. God will use it. And we can gain wisdom through experience. But here's the danger of experience. Again, it's that we know how to, to function in the what we were, might think of as the anointing. And, and so that we are, we are doing things, the minister or the, or the singer, we are doing things that look like the anointing is present. Or when we sense the moving of the Holy Spirit, we have sensed it so much in the past that we know what to do next. Now that is dangerous because the moving of the Holy Spirit, yes, even though God will use experience, we have to be careful because it, the, the way the Holy Spirit moves, we can't put him in a box. And just, the, just because the Holy Spirit moved in a certain direction the last time, or it might have been 20 years ago, or five years ago, or last, or last week, just because God moved, for example, in a, using a certain song, doesn't mean that God is going to move in that same way with that same song next week. Does that make sense? Or it could be a message or a statement that the preacher makes. That doesn't mean that it's always going to be replicated the same exact way or that God's going to move the same exact way as he did prior, okay, with that song or with that statement uh, or with a message. Uh, Hopefully that makes sense. So experience, yes, is wonderful, but experience can be dangerous because we know how. So even though it can appear on the outside based on everything that is is done, it, it appears to be anointed. That does not mean it's the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Now, in looking at these four things that the anointing is not, What I want to say next is important is that it does not mean that you and I should have a critical spirit and we're overanalyzing everything. As believers, we should be discerning, 
but we should not be overanalyzing absolutely everything. So that is important to understand. All right, with that said about four things the anointing is not, let's take a look now at what is the anointing. Well, you can see it there on the screen. The anointing is the presence of the Holy Spirit working in and through the believer, given to accomplish the will of God, always magnifying Jesus. Now, when I say they're given to accomplish the will of God, the will of God, okay, you could substitute that word there with the heart of God, the, the, the desire of God for an individual or for a church collectively. So, again, it's the presence of the Holy Spirit working in and through the believer, given to accomplish God's will, His heart, His desire in that individual, always magnifying Jesus. And that's so important to understand that the anointing of the Holy Spirit is always going to magnify Jesus. It's always going to draw us closer to Jesus. So in answering this question about what the anointing is, again, I just gave you a, a biblical definition of it. But in answering this question, it's important that we understand four types of the anointing that we see in the Bible. As well, understand that, that with these different types of the anointing, there is only one source and one Holy Spirit, just a different function. Now let's take a look at them. Number one, we see this, and this is in the Old Testament, there is the priest, prophet, and king anointing. Again, that's in the Old Testament, not in the New Testament. But in the Old Testament, priests and prophets and kings were physically anointed, indicating God's special calling on their lives. And the guidelines for this physical anointing on them were mostly the same. All right, let's take a look at number two. Number two is the physical act of anointing. Now, this refers to... Uh, anointing, as James would refer to in James chapter 5, 14 and 15. Now, this is under the new covenant in the church age, the time that we're living in right now, that the anointing oil is placed upon an individual. And this is different from the Old Testament in the sense, in this, in this sense, than in the Old Testament, we see that there would be a literal uh, horn of oil or a bottle of oil a vessel of oil in which the, the oil would be poured upon the prophet, priest, or king. In the New Testament, the physical act of the anointing is not that. It actually refers to a smearing of the anointing, normally upon the forehead. So that is the physical act of the anointing. And according to James chapter 5, 14 and 15, it is done by elders for those who are sick or those who need prayer uh, as an aid to their faith for healing. And the anointing oil is not the anointing, but it represents the anointed one, Jesus, who is our healer. So that's important. All right, now let's take a look at number three. And this is, I believe, the most important one of all that we see in God's Word. It's the personal presence of the anointing. This comes from 1 John chapter 2, verses 20 and 27. Now, this refers to the abiding presence of the Holy Spirit, or you could say Christ through the Spirit in the heart of every believer. And that's a typo there, every believer. And so every true child of God, whether they've been baptized with the Holy Spirit or baptized in water, is irrelevant. If they're born again, they have this personal presence of the anointing. Let's read it from 1 John chapter 2, 20 and 27. You can see it there on the screen. John is writing this to believers, most likely in Ephesus, and really in every generation. He says, but you have an anointing from the Holy One, and you know all things. Now verse 27, but the anointing which you have received from Him abides in you. And you do not need that anyone teach you, but as the same anointing teaches you concerning all things, and is true, and is not a lie, and just as it, is, just as it has taught you, you will abide in him. Now, this anointing that, that John was referring to was actually the personal abiding presence of the Holy Spirit in the heart of every true child of God. 
So again, as I said earlier, every true child of God has been anointed because the anointed one, Christ, dwells in the believer by the anointing, which is the Holy Spirit. So the anointing that John was referring to was referring to the Holy Spirit. Now, one of the things that I, I want to bring out about this anointing, and I this is on the handout that I'm reading from here, is according to John, this anointing, again, the Holy Spirit, it abides. That means it remains. So the, the presence of the Holy Spirit in our life as a child of God, it doesn't come and go. This anointing doesn't come and go. No, he remains here. Again, the anointing, in a sense, is really just another name for the person of the Holy Spirit. And as a child of God, we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. He abides, that means remains, in us. And I'm thankful for that. We're not a hotel for the Holy Spirit. We're the home of the Holy Spirit. So this anointing abides. Number two as John would describe it here, the, the anointing assures spiritual knowledge. Now, when John was writing to the believers in Ephesus here, one of the things that he was doing was coming against false teaching uh, that was trying to spread in the uh, church of Ephesus. And this false teaching had to do with Gnosticism, which Gnosticism, in a nutshell, was it claimed Jesus, but it claimed that Jesus was only one of many beings to get to God. And and if you really wanted to know God, yeah, you had to know Jesus. And this is what the Gnostics said. You had to know Jesus, but he was only one of many angelic beings that you had to know. And it was it was a very mystical uh, knowledge that they claimed that they had about Jesus and other angelic beings in order, to, in order to know God. And the Gnostics also taught that Jesus really didn't come in the flesh, that he was just simply a spirit being. And again, they claimed to have this special mystical knowledge about Jesus. And if you wanted to really know about God and Jesus, you had to get it through them. So this is what John was dealing with. And so what he says to them, these believers and us today, that the anointing, the Holy Spirit within us, he is teaching us. And, and through him, we know God. And so the anointing assures spiritual knowledge that we truly know God. So we don't have to know, have this mystical knowledge of, of spiritual beings or of angels or, okay, or, or any kind of other special revelation to know God. No, we just have to know Jesus, and that's the point. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through Him. Also, number three, this anointing, it teaches us. So John was saying that the Holy Spirit within us, He teaches us about the things of God. That's just like what Jesus said in the upper room discourse, that he said the Holy Spirit is going to teach you all things. Now, as it concerns the Holy Spirit teaching us, you know, verse 27, uh, John wrote, and you do not need that anyone teach you, but as the same anointing teaches you concerning all things, and it's true, it's not a lie, just as is taught you, you will abide in him. Now, when John said that you don't need that anyone teach you, he was not meaning that we don't need teachers, as Paul would talk about in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 11, that pastors and teacher. In reality, John, what he was doing here in 1 John was actually teaching them, giving them instruction. So he's not saying that we don't need teachers, that God doesn't use pastors and teachers in the fivefold ministry. No, that's not what he was saying. He was saying in light of these false teachers who were claiming that if you really want to get to know God, you have to get it through that particular teacher. Okay, John was saying, no, no, reject that. You don't need that because the Holy Spirit is teaching you. You know, how that can be applied today is in this way is that there are pastors and ministers today that claim and they tell the people that if you want to hear from God, you hear from God through 
the minister through that particular preacher and only through that particular preacher. What John is doing in this passage is coming against that type of influence on God's people. Because as God's people, no, we are not limited to one or even a group of ministers by which we hear God. Yes, God uses ministers. As I just emphasized, it, God was using John here. But again, God is not limited to whom he uses. And in reality, again, what the point John's making is that we have the teacher, the Holy Spirit, living on the inside of us. All right, number four, the anointing imparts truth. As John wrote here, but as the same anointing teaches you concerning all things and is true and is not a lie. Get this, as a child of God, we have this assurance that the Holy Spirit is always going to lead us into truth. The Holy Spirit will never lead us into error. That's so important to understand. And so he imparts truth. And then number five we see from this passage that he guards us from error. And that goes right along with number four. He imparts truth and he guards us from error. That's what the true anointing of the Holy Spirit does. And again, he lives on the inside of us. I can say this based on the authority of God's word, that if you're a born-again child of God, then you are anointed because you have the anointing living on the inside of you. Now, another thing I'll bring out that's on the handout is that this anointing, again, the personal presence of the anointing, is present in every believer no matter what level of consecration. It comes initially when we get saved and it stays perpetually through faith in Christ and what is accomplished for us at the cross. Now, this anointing, the personal presence of the anointing, the Holy Spirit within us, is most effective, that means unhindered in our life, through properly focused faith that we're trusting not in ourselves, but we're depending on Jesus and what He has accomplished at the cross. And we're trusting in what God has said in His Word. So that is how the anointing, this anointing, is most effective in our life. So if the child of God takes a casual approach to their relationship with God and is apathetic and complacent in their relationship with God, you know what? It's going to hinder this anointing of the Holy Spirit. And so it means that that believer who is apathetic or who has uh, a misplaced faith that we're trusting in ourself, okay, uh, that that opens the door for that believer to get into error. And so that is important to understand. All right, number four, the fourth aspect of the anointing is this. It's the power for function anointing. Now, when I say power for function anointing, uh, this anointing is the operation of the Spirit upon and through a believer, empowering them for a particular function. So this anointing, it's still the Holy Spirit, but it's that aspect of the moving of the Holy Spirit that, that we sense, for example, in a church service. It's the manifest presence of God that you can sense in your spirit. That's what I refer to here as the power for function anointing. Jesus, in Luke chapter 4, in verse 18, he said, The anointing is upon me to preach the gospel to the poor, to deliver the captives, to bring sight to the blind, to, to bring liberty to those who are oppressed. So what was that? That's, that's what I'm referring to here as the power for function anointing. You see, Jesus had said it, the anointing is, is upon me in order to do something. Now, this type of the anointing, like all the different aspects of the anointing, and again, it always glorifies Jesus. And like the personal presence of the anointing, the Holy Spirit in our life, the power for function anointing is most effective in our life individually and in a, in a a church collectively, when our faith is properly focused, when we're trusting in Christ's work and we're not looking to ourselves, we're not trusting in the talent 
or the, the, the charisma, the personality, okay, or even the experience of the singer or of the minister, but we're trusting in Christ. An important point to understand about the power for function anointing is that that when I when I talk about a particular function, that's not limited to preaching or to teaching or to singing. That function, it could be prayer. It could be witnessing. It could be worshiping. It could be doing anything in, in everyday life. Okay, it could be as a dad or a mom or even a grandparent. Okay, uh, it could be a greeter in a church. It could be in your secular job that the Holy Spirit is anointing you to do what God's called you to do. But what does that mean? It means that a, a, a person, a believer who's a contractor, can be an anointed contractor. Does that make sense? Uh, a lawyer can be an anointed lawyer. A doctor can be an anointed doctor. So this is what I'm talking about. When, when our heart is for the Lord and our faith is in Christ and we're not trusting in ourselves, get this, that is how this power for function anointing operates. And we can't put the Holy Spirit in a box because I tell you what, the Holy Spirit will move in ways and at times that go beyond that sometimes the box that we put him into. As I just mentioned, you know, it, it functions the best through our properly focused faith. But do you realize that the anointing of the Holy Spirit can move in a bar? The anointing of the Holy Spirit can move in a crack house? Yeah, I, yes, I mean that. What, what, do I, what am I saying? That that if a person is crying out to God in a bar, or someone is interceding for them, get this, the Holy Spirit is not limited. He can move in a dark place. And that is this power for function anointing. That the Holy Spirit can move in places that we wouldn't think that He can move in. Because, again, the Holy Spirit is not limited. And so this is something that you and I, as a child of God, we need to believe God for. As it concerns this powerful function and anointing, let me bring up another scripture reference, and we'll close with this today. Luke 11 and verse 13, where Jesus said this, If you, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him. You want the power for function anointing upon your life or upon maybe uh, someone who doesn't know Christ. You need the Holy Spirit to move upon them. Well, believe and ask. According to what Jesus said again in Luke chapter 11 and verse 13, He will give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him. That's not talking about the personal presence of the anointing in our life as a child of God. No, that's talking about this power for function anointing. And you could say it's it's the power for refreshing anointing, power for deliverance anointing, power for bondages to be broken anointing, power for salvation anointing. Does that make sense? And so you and I need to believe God and ask Him for that. And He will honor that request. He said it in His Word, Luke 11 and verse 13. Praise the Lord. I pray that this has been a blessing to you and it brings some clarity to the anointing of the Holy Spirit in your life. So God bless you and have a wonderful day in Jesus. It is our prayer that every video that you can see on this Cornell Ministries YouTube channel is a blessing to you and a help in your walk with the Lord. Let me ask you this. Would you prayerfully consider supporting Cornell Ministries through whether a one-time gift or a reoccurring monthly gift? No matter what the amount is, we would greatly appreciate it. You can do so through our CornellMinistries.com website. You can see that on the screen. Or you can text to give. Just text that number and just follow the prompts and give that way. Again, whatever the amount is, we would greatly appreciate it. God bless you greatly.